The Lord be with you. And also with, and also you. with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the hand of Moses, your servant, you led your people out of slavery and made them free at last. Grant that your church, following the example of your prophet Martin Luther King Jr., may resist oppression in the name of your love and may secure for all your children the blessed liberty of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Good morning and welcome to Coffee Talk. My name is Angela Shelley. I'm the Interim Associate for Adult Education and Pastoral Care at St. John's. On this Sunday, we honor the memory and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Today's coffee talk is titled Reflecting on Civil Rights in Tallahassee. Our presenter is Dr. Marcy Muldrow Sanders, a Florida native and the daughter of a civil rights activist. Marcy is a retired Navy commander and was only the second black female to attend the Navy's Aviation Officer Candidate School. At St. John's, Marcy serves on the vestry and is co-chair of the Becoming Beloved Community Commission. Marcy is presenting remotely today. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. I will share my screen with you and um, get started. We're on the wrong slide because we were testing some things. So good morning, good morning. So as we talk about um, civil rights, um, I don't think anybody thinks of Tallahassee as being a mover and shaker in the civil rights movement. So you're going to be surprised about some of the things that um, made national news and national impact in the civil rights movement here in Tallahassee. So the modern civil rights movement started, um, it's said to have started on December 1st, 1955, uh, when Rosa Parks would not give up her seat on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. And in Tallahassee, a, about a year later, a year and a half later, Wilhelmina Jakes and Carrie Patterson, who were FAMU students, uh, would not give up their seats on the bus in Tallahassee, which began the FAMU bus boycott. Um, so that was those were some of the seminal things that that started the movement nationally and here in Tallahassee. And then the ending of of the civil modern civil rights movement is considered to have ended in 1968. But we had new laws, but we had the same feelings, same sentiments, and so. As we progress through time, uh, a lot of things changed, a lot of things stayed the same. So today we're going to talk about um, the civil rights movement in Tallahassee and explore some of the ways we can take a civil rights pilgrimage in our own city. So as I mentioned, the catalyst for the, the modern civil rights movement was Rosa Parks um, and the first event in the national movement and then the first event in Tallahassee. The big second pivotal event here in Tallahassee was um, in, in 1960 when the Woolworths boycotts began. So these students from FAMU decided they would go and sit at the Woolworths counter and demand to be, well, not demand, but ask to be served um, at the counter where only whites could be served. Well, 18 of them were arrested. And um, so, uh, so uh, 18 were arrested initially, 11 were taken to jail. And then as we go through this, we'll talk about what happened to them. Um, so then also in 1960, because of this Woolworths event, these jail ends began. And this was the first time uh, jail ends became a thing in the civil rights movement, and that happened here in Tallahassee. Then in 1961, the Tallahassee 10 were arrested. They weren't from here. So in 1963, they had the theater protest and um, where students and local um, citizens went to some of the went to the local theater and decided they would 
tried to take in a movie and uh, they were arrested. And then in 1964, our governor Leroy Collins was present at the signing of the Civil Rights, Rights Act of 1964. So some of the interesting facts. C.K. Steel Plaza is named after um, Bethel Baptist Church's Reverend C.K. Steele. And he was one of the founders of the Inner Civic uh, Council that coordinated the bus boycotts. His son, Henry Steele, was one of the country's first JLN protesters when he was a high schooler and was arrested at the Woolworths sit-in. Then the Florida civil rights governor, Leroy Collins, went on to lead the community relations service established to implement the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He is also the father of Mary Call Proctor and their ancestral home is now the Grove Museum. And we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. There are over 20 historical landmarks in Tallahassee commemorating African-Americans impact on the community from slavery through the civil rights movement. So I'm gonna stop sharing here. I have a short video um, that uh, I would like to bring up for you. If I can find it. 56, 1956, two Florida A&M University students, Carrie Patterson and Wilhelmina Jakes boarded a Tallahassee city bus and sat down in a front seat beside a white woman. The bus driver ordered the two black students to the back of the bus. When they refused, the two women were arrested, kicking off the Tallahassee bus boycott. The boycott lasted for seven months. It led to the hiring of black bus drivers and integrated seating on Tallahassee public transportation. It led to more than a decade of civil rights protests that shattered the wall of Tallahassee racial segregation. This Thursday, Tallahassee will celebrate the 60th anniversary of the bus boycott. I think the bus boycott um, provided um, the necessary force to bring attention to the issue, also to pull the people together one, one time uh, from all walks of life, from all professions and, and different roles and even religious connections. But it also prompted many of the more progressive or liberal minds to get together and deal with some of the issues in a way in which they had not been dealt with before. I think that's the important thing mostly about the movement of the boycotts. Other, also, the fact that the boycotts proved that something could something could happen. One of the chief figures of the Tallahassee bus boycott was Henry Steele's father, the Reverend C.K. Steele, who led the Inter-Civic Council and went on to help found the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and become one of the icons of the civil rights movement. I think my dad was the person for that time here in Tallahassee. He was... Um, well connected across the country with uh, ministers and leaders uh, and across denominational lines. He was, uh, and he was one of the most outstanding preachers, I think, uh, one would ever hear. He was charismatic. He was humble, though very forceful, and consistent, as well as persistent. Yet hundreds of Tallahassee's black residents were active in the boycott, and it was their solidarity that changed the fabric of Tallahassee. Well, the bus boycott was so important because Tallahassee was not a civilized uh, place to live at that time. And since the boycott, it was somewhat like uh, washing your dirty clothes. We had to wash out the dirt. Now the city is developing into a civilized place to live.
Not completely yet, but it's coming. This is Gerald Ensley of the Tallahassee Democrat and Tallahassee.com. So. What's going on with my computer? <laughs> so that was, a, a, as you can see, some people still struggle with that time and, and the things that they experienced. And they can see that some of their work made a significant difference and some of their work not so much. So let's take a walk. On the corner of Jefferson Street and Monroe is the Tallahassee Leon County Civil Rights Heritage Walk. It's just a block, but it honors 50 of Tallahassee's foot soldiers in the civil rights movement. And it has uh, tiles for the bus boycotts, Reverend Steele, core and some of the other activities that uh, and events that occurred during that time. The John G. Riley House, which is um, also on Jefferson Street in the opposite direction, is the Center and Museum for African American History and Culture. They also are the repository of a great amount of African American history for the state of Florida some of those physical documents are housed at Tallahassee Community College, uh, who is a partner to Riley House. Riley House is also in the Smoky Hollow neighborhood. And uh, it was home to, to like over 500 residents and they were displaced in the 1960s. And they were not displaced using um, eminent domain. So they were never compensated for their homes. Their mortgages weren't paid off, but they were displaced so that um, Tallahassee could progress in their urban renewal projects. The Grove is the former home of Governor Leroy Collins and Mary Call Collins. And it is called, was called the Call Collins House. And they donated it to the state upon their death to be a museum for to tell the story of slavery and civil rights. And so you can go to the Grove, it is free, and it is um, under the Department of State of the state of Florida. And one of the cool things is in this picture that you see here is actually Governor Leroy Collins at the signing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 with President Lyndon Baines Johnson and the pen that was used to sign that legislation is actually at the, at the Grove. So other places you can see and tour and visit here in Tallahassee are the Meek Eton Archives and Research Center at FAMU. The Florida, the Museum of Florida History, which some of us know as the Junior Museum, um, has some artifacts that um, are uh, part of African American history and the civil rights movement. Uh, me, the Museum of History, the Tallahassee Museum is the junior museum. The Tallahassee, the Museum of Florida History has a great collection um, um, on a lot of artifacts throughout, um, through African American history, through slavery and the civil rights movement. Um, and they do a, a wonderful series of learning opportunities. One of, the, one of the best ones I ever took there was about quilts and what quilts meant in, um, in the Underground Railroad, which is fascinating. The Union Bank Building, which is now also an annex to the Meek Eton um, Black Archives, is a building that was preserved. The, the Union Bank building was a freedman's bank. 
And so basically it was one of the first black banks here in Tallahassee. The Taylor House Museum uh, of Historic Frenchtown tells the story of Frenchtown and their prosperity and merchants and um, life in Frenchtown, as does the Soul, Mar Soul Voices Markers of Frenchtown, which is a tour, a walking tour, and it has uh, recorded voices of um, the people who, who tell the story of Frenchtown. So Tallahassee was part of that, that frontline um, experience in um, the civil rights movement here in Tallahassee. And it's an opportunity to, because we preserve so much of that history, especially at the Riley House and um, the Tallahassee Museum and in Frenchtown that it's a great opportunity to go and do a pilgrimage right here in Tallahassee. And some of these are walking tours within walking distance of St. John's. And I encourage you to go and do that. I also encourage you to take the time to watch the documentary uh, Footsteps to Freedom, which is on the city of Tallahassee's website. And it's about an hour long um, documentary about the civil rights movement in Tallahassee. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and um, and let's talk. <laughs> okay, we have several folks in the in the um, remotely, and you you can enter your questions in the chat box, and I can read them out, and the folks in the room can just ask their questions. Y'all have any questions? Civil Rights Tallahassee. Thank you, Marcy, so much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Yes, please. Hey, Marcy, it's Karen here. I Hi, want Karen. to know a little bit more about how the public school system was integrated here in Tallahassee. I don't know anything about that. Well, Tallahassee followed a model that most of the state of Florida um, followed. Um, the schools were integrated just as I was moving here um, from Duval County. And they what they um, did initially was uh, assign teachers. So they, they did teacher swaps. And so black teachers went to white schools, white teachers went to black schools. And then gradually they, um, they, they began busing students to um, different schools outside of their, um, what would be their local school. And so that was the model pretty much that, that most of the state of Florida followed to integrate schools. Uh, I was bused from Osceola Street to Hartsfield Elementary School. Do you know if the teachers were consulted or were they just moved? Uh, they were moved. <laughs> That happened to me in Nashville, Tennessee in 1964. I taught a special mixed special needs class and I was a first year teacher and over the Christmas break, they packed me up and moved me and told me if I wanted a paycheck, I would report to this other school, which was a previously all white school in the middle of an all black housing project. Uh, and that was an amazing and sometimes dangerous adventure. And we got through two years of that and then it all settled down. Well, that's that's pretty much the way it went in Florida. I when um, by the time I got to Tallahassee, the schools had been uh, integrated because that first year was just teachers. And then as you are aware, apparently throughout the South, they, they followed a similar model. Then they started busing students. Um, but I, I remember very vividly um, my blonde haired blue eyed teacher sitting in the middle of, of a room with us. I must have been in third grade, I think I was, um, maybe second grade, second or third grade, and, the, and, and that she cried every day because yeah. the kids were so mean to her. They were, they were so mean to her. I felt so bad for her uh, all the time, but um, yeah. <laughs> Mary Bird Sims has just entered an interesting comment in the chat box. Mary Bird says that she is proud that both of her grandparents have a footprint on the foot soldier's sidewalk. Her grandparents were Clifton and George Lewis. 
many of you will remember those names and the, and those people. I don't know if you want to say anything more about them, Mary Bird. Gosh, they were so involved. Um, they were an integral part of life at that time. Mary Call would tell you that too. Um, they did brave things. My granddaddy was a banker and made loans to people that nobody else would make loans to. Um, I just, I'm, I'm always in awe of their bravery and sort of their trailblazing attitude at that time in Tallahassee. Thankful for them. Mm, that's awesome, Mary Bear. Thank you for sharing that. I remember seeing them around town when I first moved here in 1987. I remember them. Mm. Well, I, I, I met Mary Bird's grandfather. My father is a, is a contractor and uh, he was one of the first black uh, general registered general contractors here in Tallahassee. And, um, and, and I remember George Lewis, and I remember um, the first time my dad took me to Lewis State Bank and being in that big bank and them giving him a loan. And that's that's who, who funded his business for many, many, many years. So it was, a, um, I, I, have, I have often told people that without, without abolitionists throughout history and the abolitionists of today, black people would still be picking cotton. So we should not forget those people. We should all, always remember that, that there are people who are allies in the fight and, um, and, and oftentimes a great physical peril, right? Because there are people who, who did not appreciate that and they would, they act out accordingly. And so, um, that is why if you get an opportunity to take um, um, at the Florida Museum when they do the quilt series during Black History Month, it is a fascinating story because the quilts, when they hung over the fence, had a message in them. And they had directions and whether it was safe to stay or not and all of that. So a quilt hanging on the fence um, was, was a, a map and a message to runaway slaves. Marcy, this is Megan, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, the piece that you talked about where those homes were taken without um, eminent domain or anything along those lines, no compensation. Do you know if anything has been done since then? Any type of um, <laughs> you know, reparations, any type of compensation for, for that? Um, I'm not aware of any, um, um, Altamese Barnes, um, is the reason we even know anything about Smokey Hollow. She, she made it pretty much her life's mission to preserve the legacy and memory of Smokey Hollow. And she started with starting, uh, founding the Riley house and John G. Riley was, um, enslaved. He was born enslaved. And in 1954, when he died, he was a millionaire. And he was, his home is in Smoky Hollow. And so um, now there's a marker down there at the corner before you turn on Franklin, um, before you turn on to Lafayette. If you look to the right, there's a park and a marker that talks about Smoky Hollow. But to my knowledge, there have been no reparations or compensation to the families that were displaced from Smoky Hollow. Wow, thank you for that. Hi, this is Lee Johnson. I just wanted to say this is a wonderful presentation and lots of information. And I would hope to see St. John's getting a group together to do the walk. I think that would be so beneficial to all. Megan, you wanna to speak to that a little bit? I was waiting to see if you were, if it was going to be me, <laughs> but uh, yes, ma'am, you are reading our minds. That is something that um, the Becoming, Becoming Beloved Community Committee, it's a mouthful, um, that's something that we are working on um, for the church this spring, and we will have details um, coming out pretty soon on that as we get the committee up and running for 2022. So yes, that's absolutely something on our list this year. Thank you. <laughs> 
And there's, there are also other opportunities and we will probably end up taking a bus tour at some point because there are all kinds of places around town that, uh, as I mentioned, the, the Tallahassee um, Museum, the Junior Museum, for those of us who grew up here, um, one of the most fascinating places is at Tall Timbers. And Tall Timbers has taken a, a, a sharecropper home that they preserved and um, the family members have recorded uh, uh, vignettes in it and so you can go in it you can tour it you can watch um how they um did what whatever you do with sugar cane to make it sugar and syrup and all those things so um they've done a, a great job with with that as well so are there are a lot of places in Tallahassee where we have preserved history and have honored history and um that you can go see and you can go visit and you can learn about um, about this wonderful place that we call home. Um, I also would highly recommend going to the FAMU Museum. Um, I took our Grace Mission kids there and they were fascinated uh, about things they never knew, which was wonderful. And also um, I have this wonderful book called Black America Series, Tallahassee, Florida by Alphamese Barnes and Ann Roberts. Um, that Alphamy signed, um, and it's a wonderful book. So there are ways we can be educated um, and, and have fun finding out more about things in Tallahassee too. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yes, and, and please, please, please visit Riley House. It's just down the street from St. John's. Um, and uh, I, I asked Ms. Barnes to do this presentation and she is, um, so funny story i was talking to somebody about her and they said her husband had passed and i said oh my gosh i'm kind of worried to call her now because i kind of dropped the ball on this thing and then when i talked to her she says oh no calvin and i aren't doing anything right now i'm like well i'm glad to know he's not dead <laughs> and i didn't miss that <laughs> but um she's um she's a member of saint michael's and all angels and she hasn't been doing very much uh with covid and um, and I talked to a few other people. So so I would love to see us do something um, in the future that that's not during the most segregated hour of the week, uh, so we can get some of these great other voices to participate in in our in our learning here at St. John's. Um, Elizabeth, would you type the name of that book into the chat box? <laughs> yes, I will. Thank you. And we have a question from Laurel. Laurel asks, besides history, what are the opportunities for action moving forward? Oh, that's a great question. Well, you know, there, there's a lot of opportunities right now. It's a great time to be active because, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement and, and all um, NAACP and Urban League and all these organizations that exist, there are lots of uh, opportunities to plug in. I have chosen to plug in in places where I can live my faith. And so there's Capital Area Justice Ministry. There are you know, other faith-based opportunities. The Episcopal Church has work going on. So there's some great uh, opportunities that that fit where you are as a person um, in your journey. Uh, I know that Mother Abby's sitting in the room there and she's engaged in some of these things. So I'm gonna let her say words. Sure. <laughs> I, would, I would love to reemphasize that and say, if you want to be a part of the conversation and action of Capital Area Justice Ministry, these are the people you could talk to. One, and you can't write, you know, if you can't write it down and you don't want to remember right now, first, you can always call me. Um, second, these are the team leaders within the parish that are Claire Dodd, Kate Kyle, Jonathan Jackson, Jerry Lindsay, and Megan Owens. And Laura Newton. And Laura Newton. Laura Newton is actually the coordinator, the, the lay person who is coordinating all of that dialogue and connecting folks to the action that that very intentional community is coming together. And as Marcy said, it's collaborative. It is not St. John's doing this. It is 30 different congregations coming together. Thank you, Angela. Um, I missed a couple of names, but. <laughs> uh, 
it, it, there's, there's, of there's, <laughs> it's fine. Just call us. You got the good ones up there too. And we'll add the others anyways. Um, they are intentionally moving forward in the research phase of a community action. It is not um, it, that the issues have come up through the gathered community and they would love to talk to you more about that. Also, I would um, suggest that the Union of Black Episcopalians is a wonderful um, group to be a part of to build relationships because while we might want to do actions, the last thing we need to do we, I say, as a body of St. John's, is toxic charity, is assume we understand what is needed and in our great heartedness, not actually do anything helpful. So the idea of relationships always and education come before action and guide, guide our actions. And the Union of Black Episcopalians um, has been around for how many years, Marcy? <laughs> Um, wow. in its first, in its first iteration since, uh, almost since Absalom Jones. So, <laughs> so we will be talking about it in February because his feast day is on a Sunday, but um, and we'll be talking about UBE on that Sunday as well. <laughs> uh, if you want to know more about that, Susan Jones from St. John's is the vice president or secretary, one of the two. And Marcy's a member of that. I'm a member of it, but never show up because it's it's just a hard meeting night for me to get to. <laughs> uh, but Father Q, it's a beautiful um, group that gathers and currently all virtually, um, which makes it a little more accessible in an evening. So Absolutely. those are the two major ones that I would bring up. They both do action and service um, through relationship in our community. And as Absolutely. Marcy said, through our faith, yeah. Oops. And through our faith, and because everybody has has a different space that they want to occupy, right? Um, yes, Union of Black Episcopalians. Um, we will be talking about that on the Coffee Talk on February thirteenth. So if you, we would love to have you join us for that. Um, Susan Jones is vice president. I'm parliamentarian, um, and it's, it's just a great group of folks. And you do not have to be black to join. So we would love to have you join us. Um, it's the beginning of the year, and um, and um, I'm happy to reach out to you and email you or whatever. Um, let me know and get you the the information to to join our organization. Any more questions? I would love to hear a little about who Altamese Barnes is before we close. Altamese Barnes um, is is a local historian. She is a force of nature. <laughs> she is, um, she started, um, she went to um, Lincoln High School and Lincoln High School was the only high school for blacks here in Tallahassee. It's located over on Macomb Street. Um, it's now it, the, the new Lincoln Center building. Um, Sale was housed there for many years. And so she grew up here. She, she experienced Tallahassee um, through segregation, through um, the civil rights movement and all of that. And she is, and she decided one day because she is a force of nature um, to, to purchase the Riley house. <laughs> And um, and start a, a museum and a learning center and um, uh, just the, the, to create a space where people could um, could learn about history. I am looking for there's a there's a there was a nice piece on her. Their website is dead, and I don't know why, but. Um, but she was she was an educator and a historian and just a very passionate advocate for for teaching people our history because that's how people change that's how Leroy Collins changed right because he started out an advocate for segregation and, and through the course of his uh, experience and learning more, he changed his mind and it cost him his political career. And so, so Altamese Barnes is very, uh, understands that passionately 
that when we know better, we do better. And um, as Maya Angelou would say, and so, um, so that's, 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 I mean, that's who she is. She's a little tiny woman here from Tallahassee. She, she grew up, um, if I'm not mistaken, she grew up in Smoky Hollow um, and uh, went to Lincoln and grew up to be a force of nature for history and, and preservation of African-American history, not only in Tallahassee, but for the state of Florida. Okay, thank you. Um, it's getting close to time for us to close. So if there are no other questions, I wanna thank Marcy for her presentation today. This, this is excellent. You opened up some areas of interest, I think, and some areas for us, us to follow through on. So thank you so much. And thank you for all the other work you do at St. John's. All right, thank you. And if you, if we, how much longer do we have? We, well, we have nine minutes if you need okay. it. Okay. Well, hold on. Let me see what I can do here about this nine minutes. Um, you asked me a question and I want to answer that question for you. Um, what is going on here? Some people call this a shotgun home, a small rectangular wooden structure that once dotted the Smoky Hollow area of Tallahassee. Not Altamese barns. When she sees them, she thinks of the families that once inhabited them, the possessions they had, a radio table, a dresser, a chair. But these are much more than the sum of the contents of these homes. To Altamese barns, they represent plentiful food and the love within these walls. They represent the lessons from the elders and the spirit of the African-Americans that like her have always called Tallahassee home. Now walk in this house mm -hmm. and this is about the right scale. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But what you don't know is how many people are living in there. Living in there. Oh, yes. Right. So you can have five, six, seven, ten. Eight people, mm -hmm. ten. Yeah, we all fit it in. We are talking about people who are no longer here, but they are still present with us in spirit. We are talking about the spirits from the souls of people who helped to make this entire community, but definitely Smoker Hollow, what it was for so many families. And so we said, that's it, spirit houses, and that's how we got to that name. That was our house over there, yeah. okay. exactly like that. Yeah. I think it's important to preserve places like Smoky Hollow for the people and for generations to come. They are irreplaceable stories once the people who lived it are gone. Well, that's the way our fireplace was just like that, the rooms and all. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we had a big fireplace mm -hmm. and then we had a big old heater. When I think back over my life, I think about my ancestors, my mom, my dad. I'm from a large family, and I'm a sixth generation Ben Countyan. My parents, uh, my father was born on Wheelani Plantation, my mom on Waverly Plantation. Mom had 11 siblings, dad had five. So we had a lot of aunts, great aunts, granddad. They were hardworking people after slavery. The ones that I knew were not in slavery, but they were like sharecroppers, tenant farmers. And in a couple of instances, some of our ancestors owned 40 some acres of land and were independent farmers. Well, they were very hardworking people, but I never heard them complain. My parents were not college educated. In fact, they dropped out in third and 10th grade. I never heard them complain. And their whole message to us was, get your education, stay true to principles of truthfulness and hard work, and that's what you do. And then I've kind of always too been a person who liked to be different. I don't want to do what everybody else is doing. I want to do what's different that is going to make a difference. 
One of my most important involvements next to my job as principal and my church work at St. James CME is working with Booker T. Washington and the Negro Business League throughout Florida to advocate racial uplift through economics and education and promote racial harmony. This keeps me quite busy. Right now, we are in the John Gilmore Riley House. This house was almost demolished. I was involved with a group, the John G. Riley Foundation. What we realized was that the city fathers who were making that decision didn't have the rich history. Mr. Riley was born into slavery here in Leon County in 1857, right there where the Nod House is now. And after slavery, went into education went on to become the first black principal of Lincoln High School, which was the Freedman School built to educate the newly freed slaves and their descendants. And he served in that position from 1893 to 1926, so he touched a lot of lives. In addition to that, he was an astute businessman and acquired over 50 parcels of real estate all over Tallahassee. So these elder citizens saw fit to raise $95,000 to buy this house back from the city. I retired December 31st, 1995, officially. I came over here January 2nd, 1996, and started the John Gilmore Riley Research Center and Museum. We had to do some additional work by then, plumbing, electrician, the front porch was leaning, but it needed to happen. Greenwood Cemetery came about because there was discrimination in Old City Cemetery. At one time, blacks could bury in Old City, which was supported by city taxes. Well, in 1936, the city passed an ordinance that there would be no farther black barriers except for those who already owned plots and they could not buy any more spaces. So seven blacks went together and started Greenwood. It was a private cemetery and families were supposed to keep up those graves, but an 11 acre cemetery, over time, it was just unkempt. We went to the city trying to get them to take Greenwood over for perpetual care. We were able to say, the people denied barrier in Old City, continued to pay taxes that were used to keep up Old City. So they challenged us. They said, if you can raise $10,000 to do the initial cleanup and bring the cemetery to a maintainable state, we'll take it over. Aquilina Howell and I took charge of the fundraising. We told everybody we're gonna write the history of the cemetery and this whole project and everybody who gives $100, your name will be in the publication. And in about a month, we had the $10,000. We did three community cleanup days. After the third cleanup day, we put up a big tent. It was on a Saturday when we had that celebration. And we haven't cleaned Greenwood since. The city is doing a wonderful job. I've done many things in life. One of them was important was the NAACP. I was in many marches, served as state secretary for 14 years. In 1997, along with my museum work, I took on the initiative of pulling all of the African American museums in for a major conference. And from that, we established the Florida African American Heritage Preservation Network. 32 museums now from Pensacola to Miami, helping the state to preserve history overall. That led to being appointed to the board of the Institute of Museum and Library Services in D.C. And I was appointed by President Obama and served a five-year term, and that was very fruitful. One of the highlights of my personal journey is the time that I've spent with Leadership Tallahassee. I'm still a member, I'm class 19, and my classmates still support the Riley House for me. Every year when we have Rockathon, we know Leadership Tallahassee Class 19 will be there to help raise funds for the Riley House. I have not done it all. I probably won't be able to do all the things that I want to do that I know need to happen. I've only scratched the surface. Oh, thank you for sharing that, Marcy. 
And it, um, it is rolling. Oh, it is exactly new. <laughs> so we shall stop. <laughs> we have a comment as you see this from Mary Bird saying she's amazing. So y'all, everyone, thank you so much for being here. And we look forward to having another coffee talk next week which will be on the topic of, we will be talking about silent retreats. <laughs> and um, so please, please join us. It's, it's a wonderful thing if you've never done one. So it, we'll have, um, Joe McCann. Joe McCann is presenting. So thanks everyone. And thank you, especially Marcy. Thank you. Thanks, awesome. Bye. So good.